good evening uh, i welcome all the viewers of uh, my uh, doctors of uh, docs plus uh, myself dr satya gupta i am and one of the director of sims hospital today we are going to have two live session uh, by dr tejas patel uh, dr tejas uh, is a very young and dynamic cardiologist he is uh, part of our sims hospital as an interventional cardiologist he has done his uh, dm cardiology from velour with the gold medal of his name and he has done his mbbs and md in the jamnagar and he was awarded dr gm cherin gold medal for the best outgoing student in dm cardiology and he had also trained from seoul korea and hong kong for the advancement in the angioplasty like oct and ffr he did a observership for the advanced in the usa and also he has special interest in intravascular imaging and physiology like oct i was ffr these are all the new modalities in the current angioplasty treatment he also is trained in the transcatheter which is shortly called tower and the chip intervention the high risk coronary intervention dr tejas sir will give presenting two topic today one will be like is though both will be the case based one will be beyond the new guideline how diet exercise and the stress matters the other one will be the sister uh, and mi if he is 3 hour away from the cath lab how you are going to manage and for this uh, session to dr tejas sir please go ahead and present your two case thank you dr tejas hello good evening all uh, and welcome uh, to this uh, online webinar uh, i would like to first of all uh, uh, invite dr satya gupta he is a chairperson today uh, dr satya he is the director in sims hospital in ahmedabad uh, had done his basic uh, education from rajasthan jodhpur and dm cardiology from one of the most prestigious institution of india uh, christian medical college velour he did international fellowship uh from uh france paris specifically for the radial uh, intervention angiography and angioplasty he has many publications in reputed national and international journals invited by government of tajikistan to set up a cath lab and uh, he has done lots of procedures and developed the entire cath lab setup in the tajikistan uh he has been acknowledged uh, by the president of the tajikistan for the same thing awarded fellowship of the esc uh, and the uh, american college of cardiology at washington dc so today he will be joining us as a, a chairperson for uh, both the session and as he uh, rightly mentioned today's topic is like two different aspect one is regarding the lifestyle uh, modification specifically uh, its role in the hypertension management and second is one of the dreaded emergency or the uh, acute uh, emergency in the field of cardiology and how to manage that is st elevation myocardial infarction so let's start uh, with uh, Uh, both the session uh, and uh, the next thing will be the slides uh, which is going to start right now uh, my topic is regarding the <coughs> non pharmacological measures which can affect the hypertension and what is the scientific evidence behind that what uh, so far what we know scientifically about the diet exercise and the stress uh, and its association with the hypertension so <coughs> starting with the diet healthy dining habit formation is a very very difficult thing to establish to get established in the population and as a individual thing also dining out is a challenge because of the lots of factors like american style big meals uh, refined grains red meat unhealthy fats and sugary drinks and in our scenario in our country like uh, more sort of fried items and the unhealthy unhealthy oil which is used for the frying thing uh we are eating fewer fruits vegetables and whole grains and fruits which is very good actually in fact you will be surprised to know that the average restaurant meal today is more than four times larger than what it was in 1950s so it is very very challenging to get establish the healthy lifestyle uh for the reduction of the all over cad and the hypertension uh there is a sci- nice systemic review and the meta analysis which was published in jama in uh, 2014 uh that was the uh, meta analysis of all the control trials and the observational studies and they 
uh, found the studies in the two uh, group of population. One is pure veg population, and another is the mixed uh, uh, mixed diet uh, population with the mixed diet. And they have found that the consumption of the vegetarian diet is associated with the lower blood pressure in comparison to the population who are eating mixed uh, diet. Vegetarian diets included in the group or in the studies uh, uh, is defined as the dietary pattern that exclude or rarely include the meats. And some vegetarian diets includes dairy products, eggs and fish. So all vegetarian diets emphasize, most of the diets emphasize in the study, uh, in the study population, foods of the plant origin, particularly vegetables, grains, legumes and the fruits. And in that observation studies, they have found that the consumption of the vegetarian diet was associated with the lower systolic and the diastolic blood pressure by almost 6.9 by 4.7 millimeter of mercury. Now, one logic or the one evidence behind that, that is that vegetarian diet is associated with the lower blood pressure in comparison to the mixed diet is that the high level of the uh, glutamic acid amino acid in the vegetarian diet in comparison to the other amino acids which are higher in the mixed diet or the non-veg diet. And uh, dietary glutamic acid have independent blood pressure lowering effect, which may contribute to the inverse relation of the vegetarian protein to the blood pressure. SCCHO guideline again mentioned for the primary prevention of CAD, hypertension, everything, the dietary pattern which is not good or unhealthy and actually it increases the CVD mortality are sugar and low calorie sweeteners, high carbohydrate diets, refined grains, trans fat, saturated fat, sodium and the red meat. So most of the time they promote for the healthy plant-based diet or the Mediterranean-like diet, which has shown to reduce the uh, all-cause mortality as well as the CVT, uh, CVT mortality. Now, another important thing, what we know is the DASH diet. Uh, diet against uh, hypertension, to stop the hypertension uh, for the healthy blood pressure, for the reduction of the blood pressure as well as, well as for the prevention. And the main components are the grains and the fresh fruits and vegetables, which should be taken in the large proportion in the multiple servings in a day. In the medium proportion, low fat dairy products, lean proteins and the legumes, nuts and seeds should be taken. And most of the time, fats and the sweeteners or the sweet should be avoided uh, in the daily diet. This is called as DASH diet and which has shown to improve the blood pressure in their hypertensive patients. Now, this is a very, uh, very good analysis of the subgroup of the uh, DASH uh, diet group. They have divided into three subgroups. Uh, the green one is the uh, population who, who is having diet with low fruit vegetables and the uh, low fat dairy products, which is having minimal or no effect on the blood pressure reduction. The middle one, the black one, are the population who are consuming the diet which is rich in the fruits and vegetables, but not no dairy products, no low fat dairy products. They have mild to moderate, almost mild antihypertensive uh, effect, my, uh, blood pressure reduction effect. And the lowest group, the red one, which are the population who consume a uh, good amount of the fruits, vegetables, and fat and cholesterol, which are the low fat uh, dairy products. And they have the uh, maximum uh, blood pressure reduction uh, effect uh, of the systolic and the diastolic. Now, the next important thing is exercise. Uh, it is again very, very important despite the public health emphasis for the regular fit of the exercise, approximately 50% of the adults in the United States do not meet minimum recommendation. And in fact, in our country, it might be worse. So uh, it is very, very important to uh, uh, guess establish that culture of the exercise for the reduction of the all over reduction of the CVD and the uh, hypertension reduction. Uh, the usual recommendation SCCHA is that at least 150 minutes per week of the moderate intensity or 75 minutes per week of the vigorous intensity exercise should be done. Uh, that includes a variety of the other exercise and that includes only 30 minutes of the moderate exercise per day, five days in a week. That is more than enough and that is having a beneficial effect. So how to define that moderate and the vigorous intensity exercise is that moderate intensity exercise like examples are like brisk walking to 2.4 to 4 four miles per hour. So in one uh, hour, if you walk five, uh, four miles, that is called as moderate intensity act activity, biking five to nine miles per hour, uh, ballroom dancing, active yoga, recreational swimming, all are moderate intensity activity. Vigorous intensity activity are like jogging, running, uh, biking more than 10 miles per hour speed, single tennis, playing sing uh, single tennis and swimming laps. So these are the few examples of the moderate and the vigorous uh, uh, physical activity which is recommended 
uh, by the SCCHA. And the last thing is the stress management. Uh, stress is considered a factor, risk factor for the development of the high blood pressure. And there are various factors, because uh, uh, various reasons behind that, uh, like poor food choice, the patient who is a person who is in stress, having poor food choice, lack of exercise, and having comfort food, which is high in saturated fat and sodium. Now, stress management can be lots of things, can be, can be done with the lots of things, including yoga and pranayama. And there are there are various studies which has uh, which has detected uh, the association of the stress and the hypertension, uh, and they have found that stress can elevate systemic blood pressure. But so far, we don't have enough data to conclude that the stress management technique lower blood pressure enough to have the scientific advantage. Uh, there are lots of studies which may be coming up in the couple of years uh, which can address this issue. Modest effect on the diastolic blood pressure uh, only, uh, but there is no effect on the systolic blood pressure so far, the study says. Uh, there is a scientific statement published by the American Heart Association regarding the meditation and the cardiovascular reduction. And they have mentioned that the studies of the meditation to date suggest a possible, though not definitely established, benefit of the meditation on the cardiovascular risk reduction. So to summarize all the things, you can see these are all are the non-pharmacological interventions so far the scientific evidence we, we have for the reduction of the blood pressure and the patient uh, of the hypertension the majority or the maximum benefit is with the healthy diet which is having the major impact on the reduction of the systolic and the diastolic blood pressure in comparison to the other manovia though other manovias like a reduction in the intake of the dietary sodium uh, weight loss uh, the different uh, physical activities uh, uh, as well as the moderation of the alcohol intake also associated with the reduction of the uh, blood pressure. So, but the best thing is the best maneuver or the best measure, non-pharmacological measure is that healthy diet, which we need to promote for the reduction of the, and which we need to give advice to the patients of the uh, hypertension, hypertensive patients. Now the take home message that exercise using aerobic, isometric and the resistance training can lower the blood pressure. So far what we know is stress management lowers the diastolic blood pressure slightly, but no long-term impact on the systolic blood pressure has been demonstrated so far. We need a more further evidence uh, for this confirmation. And the nutritional interventions such as plant-based diet or the DASH diet, Mediterranean diets are associated with the lower CV card uh, cardiovascular burden, high quality of the life and the longer uh, life expectancy, as well as the hypertension and its complication. My topic is regarding enteral ST elevation MI. We know that reperfusion is the main treatment Either either thrombolytic agent, uh, giving thrombolytic agent or uh, primary angioplasty, <coughs> primary angioplasty. But what is the best treatment when the, there is a delay to shift the patient to the kettle? So let's talk about that. We all know that time is the myocardium in the ST elevation, myocardial infarction. Everything is all everything is about the time. As fast as possible, you open the infarcted artery. There is a main uh, treatment approach uh, in the patient of the STEMI and. Uh, as, as fast as possible, you open the infarcted artery, you can save the ischemic myocardium and prevent the uh, infarction progression. Now, this thing is very, very important. If you see that uh, initial four to six hours after the onset of the ST elevation myocardial infarction is very, very crucial. The reason is that that, that uh, sustainability of the myocardium to the ischemia is there up to certain time period. After six hours or even beyond that, there is a less chance or less benefit of any kind of intervention, either angioplasty or even giving thrombolytic agent. So initial six hours, if the patient's presentation is early, it is very, very important that you choose appropriate thrombolytic, uh, uh, appropriate reperfusion therapy to give the maximum survival benefit to the patients to prevent the ischemia, to, uh, to prevent the further infarction of the myocardium and to save the myocardium. We all know the system flow of the STEMI patients Diagnosis, transport, and the treatment. These are the very, very important. The first thing is the diagnosis, that which is called as for FMC, first medical contact. The patient either reached to the hospital directly or patient can be diagnosed having ST elevation marker infarction when they call for the ambulance and the ECG facility is available in the, in the ambulance itself. So diagnosis is very, very important. Once the patient is diagnosed having ST elevation marker infarction, the next thing is whether, how fast we can start the treatment and for that, how we can arrange the transport, whether to shift to the Kettler facility, whether to shift to the facility where the thrombolyte, thrombolysis is available, and how fast we can start the treatment in the form of thrombolytic agent, uh, giving thrombolysis or the primary angioplasty. So this is very, very important and this, that we need to understand very well. 
Now let's start with one first question. In acute STEMI patients, what is the ideal door to renal time? I think everybody uh, we, uh, present here must be knowing that. So uh, send your response, uh, whether it is a 10 minutes, 30 minutes, 60 minutes or 120 minutes. You can give by the voting pad. What is the ideal door to renal time? Oh, still there is a tie between B and C, 30 and 60. Okay, so ideal door to needle time is 30 minutes. So if the patient reaches to the hospital and you're planning for the thrombolysis, it should be started within 30 minutes. And nowadays we have the bolus uh, thrombolytic agent. So it should be given within 30 minutes and thrombolysis is over in 30 minutes. And that should be the ideal time to save the patients to save the myocardium. Now there is another concept is the FMC2 balloon time. We know that door to balloon time is 60 minutes. That is when the patient reaches to the hospital uh, at the PCI facilities available. Angioplasty, primary angioplasty should be done in less than 60 minutes. And we at SIMS, we have 45 minutes or less ideal uh, door to balloon time in our hospital, uh, which is as per the standard guideline. So FMC to balloon time is that when the first diagnosed ST elevation marker and infarction, the angioplasty should be done within two hours, 120 minutes. That is the newer concept and uh, in the newer guidelines. So let's come to the case, 60 years old lady with interval STEMI with the three hours of the window period hemodynamically completely stable, uh, but can be shifted to the PCI. It takes three hours to reach to the PCI capable center. So what will you do? Transfer immediately to the PCI, uh, primary PCI center as the patient is stable. We can shift directly in the ambulance even ICU on wheel. Second, start IV tyrofibin and transfer for the facilitated PCI. Give full dose of fibrinolytic therapy or D, give half dose of fibrinolysis, IV tyrofibin and shift to the facilitated PCI. The time starts now. Okay, so majority giving C. Excellent, good. So let's see, let's discuss what is the fundamentals behind that. Uh, there is no doubt that primary PCI is the gold standard in the patient with the angioplasty whenever it is available in all forms, like death, in all endpoints, death, uh, non fatal MI, recurrent ischemia, all cause mortality. Primary PCI is far superior than the thrombolysis in any form of thrombolysis. Uh, this is based on the multiple trials and the meta analysis. But this is very, very important study, which has been published uh, in American Journal Cardiology in 2003 by Nalamoto. He has done the meta-analysis of the 13 trials, which has shown that the mortality benefit with the primary PCI is lost if there is a PCI-related delay more than 60 minutes. So that means that if the patient reaches to the hospital, uh, we need to shift the hospital where the PCI facility is available, but the delay is more than 60 minutes. That means better you thrombolize those patients and then shift to the PCI or then you do the next treatment. That is giving more benefit to the patient in the form of myocardial salvage and the mortality benefit. So this thing is very, very important and should be kept in the mind. That's why when the patient uh, PCI uh, uh, delay, in the, delay in the shifting to the PCI uh, center, if it is more than three hours in our patient, the fibrinolysis is the first thing we should give it. And these are the thrombolytic agents. Preferably nowadays, it should be given the IV uh, bolus thrombolytic agents, especially the tenetiplase and the retiplase, which is having very fast action and no delay in the treatment onset. Now, this is very important. Now, what is the percentage of the STEMI patients thrombolyzed with the streptokinase achieve TIMI grade 3 flow? We know that TIMI 3 flow is the uh, main target of the STEMI patients. That is the main treatment achievement we, which we want. So it is 30%, 50%, 70% or the 90%. Your time starts now. Ideally, it should be the 100%. In all the STEMI patients, after the reperfusion therapy, it should be the 30, 100%. So what percentage we achieve with the streptokinase? Okay, so it is a tie, almost tie, 30 to 50% and almost all are right. So this is the all thrombolytic agent, 90 minutes minutes patency rate and the TME 3 flow achievement. You can see that even the best agent, that is the tenetiplase or the retiplase, we got... TME 3 flow achievement of only 60% in the 60% uh, of the patients. And the 90 minute patency rate is hardly 75%, which we can achieve more than 95% in most of the primary angioplasty patients. So that's why after giving the thrombolytic therapy, if, in though the, uh, even though the patient is hemodynamically stable, no uh, complication immediately, 
there is a high risk that the patient can have the complication at any time and those patients uh, survival will be very very down so that's my wait and watch approach even after giving the thrombolysis and even it is a successful thrombolysis it is not recommended and uh, even after successful thrombolysis uh, uh, because of the reocclusion rate is very high you need to shift those patients to the pci capable facility uh, in the center where the pci is possible and that is called as pharmacoinvasive approach so all the patients when the pci is not possible in less than 120 minutes in 2 hours after the first medical contact all the patients should get immediate thrombolysis preferably if possible the uh, bolus thrombolytic agents and then followed by immediately transfer of all those patients to the pci capable center without any delay irrespective of the seeing success or the failure of the thrombolytic agent now those patients shifted to the pci capable center should undergo angioplasty uh, angiography and angioplasty immediately if there is a if it is a failed thrombolysis that is called as rescue ptca rescue angioplasty if it is a successful thrombolysis the angiography and angioplasty should be done within 24 hours from 3 to 24 hours to uh, avoid the reocclusion the reinfarction in most of the patients and we have the landmark trial stream trial uh, published in the NEGM couple of years ago which has shown that the pharmacoinvasive approach now specifically when the patient's presentation is early specifically in all in in this trial all the patient's presentation was almost within 6 uh, hours of the window period so we have shown that it is a beneficial when the patient presents early you give the thrombolytic agent and then shift all these patients to the angioplasty center for the early intervention that is called as pharmacoinvasive which is better in comparison to the shifting all those patients to the primary angioplasty when there is a delay is more than uh, one hour and thrombolytic agent used in this trial was the tenetap plus so take home message primary pci is a gold standard in the stemi patients there is more, mostly not accessible in our country in the peripheral center and the uh, in peripheral center and pci is not possible in less than 20 120 minutes the aim should be provide thrombolysis as soon as possible newer generation thrombolytic agents should be given it is better and post thrombolysis should follow the pharmacoinvasive approach which is called as deep drip and ship what we call as a drip and then you ship the patient to the pci capable center thank you very much and my topic is regarding the <coughs> non pharmacological measures which can affect the hyper It was an excellent presentation, and uh, we can discuss the questions uh, which were asked by the audience. Can we can we have the discussion on the questions which was asked by audience? Sir? Yeah, so, so we can start the question answer session now, uh, Prasadya. Yeah. So I the first question the was asked. asked by somebody that in diabetic patient uh, is banana is recommended or not or is prohibited it's not really dr tejas you would uh, like to answer that yeah so in diabetic patient usually they say low calories diet will be good uh, and the sweet fruit should be avoided uh, routinely to reduce the glycemic index that is glycemic index is very very important though it is not the part of the uh, topics today what we have discussed uh, or what we have presented yeah. but uh, the most important thing is that glycemic index of any food is very very important uh, when you consume any uh, food specifically in the diabetic patients and uh, that's why the banana should be restricted uh, in the patients because of the high glycemic index and high calories so it should be not prohibited we can't say prohibited but yes uh, the recommendation we can say it is down and uh, it should not be routinely uh, given in all the patients of diabetic patients yeah like uh, uh, the diets divided into three category very high in uh, like uh, glycemic index uh, intermediate glycemic index and the low glycemic index uh. like fruits uh, usually the melons uh, watermelons uh, musk melon and uh, you can say banana mango is a high glycemic index so in all diabetic uh, should be avoided or rather avoided or may be taken in the small quantity so i think uh, that answer the next question was is treadmill for 30 minutes daily safe and uh, if the patient's cardiac evolution is normal i think uh, okay. everybody should do exercise every day 30 to 40 minutes in, they can do the cardio means uh, treadmill or whatever aerobic exercise basically so everybody is recommended the no Yeah, a healthy person 
as well as patient with the diabetic or hypertension anybody can do exercise until unless doctor is specifically warned not to do excessive exercise otherwise the 30 to 40 minute daily exercise is recommended to everybody you want to add up part now it is actually international guideline to go for the at least daily 30 minute uh, workout yeah. uh, for the benefit of the heart and definitely as yes, cardiac evaluation is important you should know some signs like uh, uh, chest pain on uh, exertion while doing exercise or unusual breathing problem, unusual uh, uh, acidity like symptoms like uh, burning pain in the stomach. Then all these things require further cardiac evaluation uh, before you continue uh, your exercise. So yes, it is important to do the 30 minute exercise. It is very, very safe. Definitely very, very safe. So there is one question for you, Dr. Satya, like role of yoga and meditation in the prevention of the hypertension. Would you like to highlight, uh, enlighten us? Yeah. See, <laughs> uh, see uh, uh, these, uh, these all are the lifestyle modification uh, helps in this kind of chronic diseases. Like diabetes is a chronic disease, hypertension is a chronic disease, uh, dyslipidemia is chronic diseases. So any kind of this chronic uh, diseases, not infective but chronic diseases, uh, uh, this changes in lifestyle really helps. I would recommend to all my patients usually to do 60 minutes every day you spare for yourself 20 minutes for the yoga 20 minutes for meditation and 20 minutes for the exercise see the name sounds similar that yoga i made is everything is similar but if you really see these three things are not similar the exercise is totally different than what you do in the yoga and the pranayama so I, my recommendation is that everybody should spare at least 60 minutes in a day in the morning time or whatever with 20 minutes for yoga, 20 minutes for pranayama, and 20 minutes for the aggressive exercise. Uh, that's what I recommend. And definitely, see, the, the first line of management for hypertension, for diabetes, for this lipidemia, it's a lifestyle modification. If you restrict your like uh, high calorie content food, uh, high salt food, uh, high fatty food, uh, definitely you can at least control 8 to 10 percent of the disease by this. And uh, the, the medicine comes as a second line of drug. So I think patient with the hypertension, patient with diabetes, patient with dyslipidemia, they should definitely first try with the this lifestyle modification. So it's strongly recommended. So there is another long question. We can divide into two. Let's see. ECG at rest shows changes of inferior wall ischemia, but patient can climb Chotila or other mountain easily. Okay. So what do you want to ask about that? There is a I think, I think uh, it's it a yeah, it's a vague question, but uh, yes, definitely. If patient is ECG suggestive inferior wall MI, then I am hundred percent sure he cannot climb Chotila because there has to be some some. Uh, so in ECG changes of migraine infarction means patient is having heart attack. So you cannot either patient cannot go anywhere and he has to go to hospital because he will be having severe chest pain, ongoing chest pain. So he cannot even. Think of going to toilet also, but uh, how can you go to Chotila? So I think there is a like uh, maybe some. Uh, yeah, I think he can go, but only Mataji can save him. Yeah. Or her. <laughs> but it can happen. See, there are there are exceptions. Uh, in our practice also, we have few patients with the left main ripple vessel disease advised for CABG, and the patients are on medications for years. Nothing has happened. But in our practice, there are patients with a single vessel disease and not treated as per the recommendation and had episode had a news like sudden cardiac death so what what we suggest or what all this guideline is based on the lacks of patients study has been done on the lacks of patients it is a randomized study it is an epidemiological survey and everything and which has shown that the patient with the high risk features like in the, uh, any kind of ischemia ECG ischemia changes ripple vessel disease and all those patients whenever it is indicated appropriately should go for the revascularization and uh, should not neglect those symptoms, those signs, uh, uh, whenever it is possible. So, yeah, that patient can go to the Chotila, but yes, he may not come back. Uh, <laughs> there on is the a high possibility. On his own. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, second, they uh, ask any relation between blood supply along with nerve supply of stomach, uh, inferior MI, heart attack, uh, reproducible heavy pain. So, again, this is a, like a the heart, heart attack symptom can be anywhere like patient can have pain on the chest can have the bilateral shoulder pain jaw pain back pain and the hand pain so and some patient can have even the epigastric that uh, stomach portion 
so most common in the inferior wall mi the most common symptom is epigastric pain we have seen patient has been treated by gastritis or some kind of just abdominal pain and later on when we do ecg we found out that patient was in fact suffering from the inferior wall myocardial infarction so it's advisable if the prolonged epigastric pain we should have at least one ecg done so that we may not miss inferior wall mi next question is okay most of the deaths in covid 19 are due to sudden myocardial infarction how is it related how can we prevent it okay so uh, i'll i'll give some ideas about that so most of the deaths in covid 19 it is not right it is there are few cases and few uh, incidents which has been documented so far because we have limited uh, information limited data for this new disease where patient have a uh, uh, presentation of the myocardial infarction and uh, during angiography uh, it has been found that there is a thrombus or the embolization in the major coronary arteries uh, now one of the mechanism or one of the hypothesis which has been uh, shown which has been found in the covid 19 is that the, these patients are uh, having high d dimers and high high probability of the thrombus formation and even uh, pulmonary infarction uh, possibility is also very high so because of the high d dimer and high probability for the hemo uh, thrombophilia uh, these patients having myocardial infarction which is sometimes not related to the uh, atherosclerotic disease but it is uh, primarily a thrombotic reason which is creating the mi so yes there are not most of the deaths but yes there are some incidents and few re uh, case reports has been found that uh, mi is there uh, uh, is uh, is possible in the covid 19 and uh, the most important thing to prevent is to give the flexin or anticoagulation that is very very important and in fact in our hospital uh, what treating the covid 19 patients we have the protocol of giving flexin either in the od or twice daily subcutaneously and uh, based on the d dimer report and it is universal for all the covid 19 patients should Yeah, just just to add on this, uh, the correct cur uh, current understanding of COVID is very much defined that uh, patient have hypercoagulable state. So they we have seen patient uh, like presenting with acute MI or acute pulmonary embolism. So I think as they just said that our protocol is very clear that once the patient diagnosis is having a moderate to severe category, we give low molecular heparin to all the patients. Uh, to prevent this clot formation and subsequent development of the myocardial infarction or pulmonary embolism so it's advisable right the okay so next, next question yeah you can go you can go ahead yeah. the next question is uh, why it uh, collar blood pressure is always higher than the home natural see whenever uh, you go to a doctor definitely you are you you have some kind of uh, uh, like anxiety in your mind uh, what doctor will tell uh, how what disease i will be diagnosed so like most of the patient when they enter to the hospital their pulse rate uh, uh, become very high so and the mathematically if you see physiology the blood pressure formula is bp equal to cardiac output and the heart rate so your heart rate goes high and your blood pressure goes up so but when you are at home you are relatively relaxed so most of the time when you are at home your blood pressure will be under control we expect 10 to 15% of percent rise in uh, blood pressure when you are in the clinic that is that's why the white coat hypertension is always higher than the ambulatory or home monitoring home home blood pressure okay next question is okay role of cholesterol in mi and stroke so uh, what else is the what else can be the reason for the mi and stroke what else what else can be the reason for the atherosclerotic uh, problems atherosclerotic vascular disease Uh, it is very well proven and it is it has been known that even by the biopsy even the histological examination the plaque formation uh, which is happening in all atherosclerotic uh, arterial disease is the primary problem is because of the cholesterol deposition and there are multi these are the multifactorial disease uh, lots of factors which are responsible for the generation or the pathogenesis of the atherosclerosis process but the primary problem is the deposition of the cholesterol uh, inside the arterial wall and then subsequent uh, build up of that creating uh, problems like myocardial infarction and the stroke so cholesterol is a primary problem or primary pathology uh, responsible for the mi and stroke and that's why in some of the animals in some of the mammals uh, where the cholesterol level is very very low 
the incidence of mi and stroke is very very low almost negligible or almost none so it is very 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 well proven that cholesterol is the primary problem in all the atherosclerotic uh, vascular disease yeah i agree so, so next, next question uh, you can and yes dr sanjay you can uh, next question is what is the critical ecg finding in a patient with acute myocardial infarction uh inter insert uh, like there are so many ST elevation st depression uh, t inversion all these things but here uh, if uh, everybody is a doctor i would like to say nowadays we see the ecg but uh, we don't only see the myocardial infarction but again we see lot of things apart from the myocardial infarction based on the how much st elevation is there in the leads we can find out what is the prognosis of the patient in how many leads is the st elevation again that suggests the prognosis in how many leads along with the st elevation there is a st depression that again suggests the uh, uh, prognosis if there is a st elevation along with st elevation avr then again it's a very high risk category so like in the ecg mostly it's a two type we see st elevation and non st elevation but along with the st elevation mi also we see so many things sir, to overall uh, diagnose the patient and define its uh, like uh, risk category so there are so many things which we see in the ecg in the given patient right okay so next question is uh, in which case would you prefer radial angiography or angioplasty <laughs> very good question I would say uh, I think it should be the reverse thing, a reverse way. In which yeah, case would you prefer to do the femoral angiographies and angioplasties? Because uh, out of our uh, thousand procedures, uh, uh, hardly I see ten or fifteen patients going undergoing uh, femoral intervention. Most of the patients, almost ninety-nine percent, or even say I would say almost more than ninety, uh, or than even that, uh, we all uh, prefer to do the radial angiographies and angioplasties, and that is a scenario all over the world and all over the states in even India, because the reason is that uh, the complication rate is very very low uh, in com uh, comparison to the femoral angiography and angioplasty. And radial angiography is very comfortable to the patient, uh, very fast recovery and low low rate of complication. Even some of the study has shown that is it's having mortality benefit uh, over the femoral intervention. So definitely, uh, we would prefer to do the radial intervention in almost all patients whenever it is feasible. In few subset of the patient, when there is a radial spasm or uh, loss of pulse of the radial artery, uh, or even sometimes some complex intervention. Nowadays, we are doing chip intervention. There is a complex intervention uh, in those patients, like bifurcation stenting, uh, left main stenting. Even though almost 80-90 percent cases of this complex intervention can be done through the radial, and what we are doing it uh, in our center. But in those patients, we should opt for the femoral approach. Otherwise, most of the patients uh, we would like to do the radial approach. Okay. The next question is: okay. What are the risk factor for aneurysm, a common complex on myocardial infarction? See, okay, I think aneurysm. aneurysm. Yeah, I yeah. think uh, they are talking about that. So, aneurysm is aneurysm, or it's a bulged out part of the heart which was already damaged by the myocardial infarction. So. The risk factor is same like any condition, any risk factor which causes myocardial infarction is a risk factor for the aneurysm. So, like ST elevation, myocardial infarction is the most common cause of uh, like uh, uh, aneurysm. Otherwise, non-ST elevation MI usually they have the angina kind of picture, but uh, usually they don't have the fully infarcted myocardium. So, chances of less in the non-ST elevation myocardial infarction compared with the ST elevation myocardial infarction. Okay, so next question is: In what percentage of hypertensive patients do you observe improvement with stress and diet management? Okay, so very good question. And uh, uh, in fact, uh, in our setup, uh, in our clinic, we would like to uh, talk about the stress and diet management in each and every hypertensive patients. Uh, basically, the young patients uh, respond very well uh, with the stress and the diet, diet management because the most important factor in the younger generation is the stress, which is responsible for the hypertension and the CAD uh, nowadays. So that is very very important. Diet management is very important, specifically in the patients with the uh, resistant hypertension. Reduction in the salt, some uh, like DASH diet, what we discussed, uh, that is very very important and that gives additive effect uh, to the uh, medications. 
and uh, in those patients the response to the hypertension uh, blood pressure managed blood pressure control is very very good so uh, yes it is very very important and uh, very uh, well known well known, well proven uh, uh, things where the uh, stress and the diet management is useful useful and the same thing we observe in our practice also so okay. the next so, question is role of clopidogrel aspirin statin metoprolol in peripheral center i think uh, all peripheral centers are giving uh, even aspirin clopidogrel metoprolol all the patients with the uh, acute coronary syndrome or myocardial infarction so i think uh, all doctors the uh, if like md or uh, mbbs who treat the myocardial infarction they are giving all this medication routinely so they have very much uh, important role in management of this kind of patients good uh, the next question oh it's a very good question the diabetic patient with steny post by diffuse disease what is the appropriate management very good question in fact uh, i encountered the same scenario last week when i did the steny of one of the patients but one thing is clear see in the steny patients the management is clear there should be the primary angioplasty uh, you need to open the occluded artery now the problem starts after uh, after doing coba that is what is what we call as a balloon angioplasty when we do the balloon and when we see the artery is diffusely diseased then it is very very difficult uh, to take the decision further like in my patients the artery uh, it was a lad infarction lad 100% occluded and i did the coba but the distal artery uh, the distal to the lesion it is very very small it is almost 1.5 mm in the diameter and diffusely diseased throughout uh, its course so in those and the patient young uh, middle aged female and long standing diabetes so definitely this type, kind of patient is very difficult to put the stent and very difficult to send for the cbg also so one thing one approach is that uh, we can do the poba like in this patients we have done in many many times improves uh, the diameter improves and later on we can send those patients for the cbg aggressive medical management is very very important in terms of diabetes control and the uh, high dose statin therapy and uh, in sub few subset of the patients uh, nowadays we have a stent uh, of 2 mm in the diameter and in those patients diffuse this is small caliber artery we can plan uh, stenting with the smaller diameter stent and uh, bypass with the end arterectomy there is again a proven beneficial uh, role uh, in the diabetic patients with the diffuse disease. good doctor tejas it was a good nice answer uh, the next question is if the if the if the precious time for primary pci is lost would you perform it at later date is a very good question again uh, which doctor tejas has already clear that see you see a patient with acute myocardial infarction and if you see if it's possible to send a patient directly to cath lab you just send to a cath lab and if you feel that patient cannot reach a cath lab or door to needle time cannot be less than 30 minutes then you go ahead with the thrombolysis and then once the patient is stable then you immediately send to a pci capable center or to a cath lab so no yes definitely the the uh, like the golden time once the patient uh, could not reach to the cath lab uh, as soon as possible after thrombolysis after stabilizing the patient you can send patient to a pci capable center that should be the ideal approach which he said the drip and ship so first you manage the patient give thrombolytic agent and then you immediately ship to a patient to a angioplasty capable center right so the next question is it is said that collaterals are developed when coronary artery is blocked we shunt blood from this collateral by doing bypass and thus harm more what is you say what is your say okay it's a very basic question uh, but it is a very good observation uh, let me give you the example we have three coronaries in our heart right so when collaterals develop collateral development happens when there is a 100% uh, block in the artery most of the time or subtotal occlusion there is 100% occlusion and sub uh, or subtotal occlusion when there is a 70% 60% 80% block uh, it is it is not visible because the artery is still flowing right so when there is a 100% occlusion let's say out of three artery two vessels having 100% occlusion and there are uh, lots of collaterals like rc and circumflex having occlusion and the lad let's for the example uh, let's say the example like uh, take the example like that 
an LED is giving collaterals to the RCA and the circumflex. Now, when you put the uh, when you do the bypass surgery, you are giving extra conduits for that. The patient is dependent only on the LED circulation, and if there is some, if something happens to the LED circulation, then there will be the huge problem, or you can say even sudden cardiac death of uh, death to the patient. So, doing bypass surgery that doesn't mean you are you are like shunting these collaterals. You are giving the extra support to the artery which is giving or which is feeding through the collaterals. So that is a one basic problem, a basic uh, fundamentals for doing bypass surgery in those patients. Uh, if the patient doesn't have a hundred percent blockage, you won't see collaterals in all the patients. Even though patient having hundred percent blockage, you don't see uh, collaterals in all the patients. So that's why it is very very important to do the bypass surgery when it is appropriate. There is no contraindication per se when the patient having collaterals and you should not go for the bypass. Yeah, very good. So the next question is, is there any role of thrombolytic agent in non-STEMI with high biomarker? Oh. See, there is a fundamental difference between the STMI and non-ST elevation MI. ST elevation MI means arteries 100% occluded. And non-ST elevation MI means arteries not 100% occluded. It's partially open. That's why for 100% closer artery, we want to give thrombolytic agent. So at least we can establish some flow. For non estilosan MI, there is not a question that already there is a flow. So by giving the thrombolytic agent, you are partially opening the vessel. But ultimately, what will happen? Once you open the vessel, that thrombolytic agent will release the so many pro-thrombotic substance in the blood. And that can lead to reinfarction. So that is the that's the important uh, the things Dr. Tejas told that once you do the thrombolytic therapy, then again there is a still there is a risk of reocclusion. That's why you should send a patient to a PCA capable center. And for giving thrombolyte to a non-STL with an MI patient where artery is already occlu uh, partially opened, you are giving thrombolytic therapy and you are releasing more thrombolytic substance in the blood. So there is a you are making patient prone for developing a STL with an MI. So usually it's by science, it's a not recommended in patient with the non STLS and MI. Thrombolysis already always recommended in patient with the STLS and MI. Okay. Very good answer, Dr. Satya. So I think uh, uh, we have given all the questions, uh, answers, and almost time is also about to uh, get over now. So uh, I would like to thank you, Dr. Satya, for joining us. I uh, would like to thank you, uh, Doc Plexus, uh, for uh, providing wonderful platform uh, for the online academics in this COVID era. COVID era. And uh, uh, I hope that uh, all of you uh, enjoyed today's session and uh, must have learned a lot of things from this uh, live discussion. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. And good night, all of you.